people love it. Candid stuff. I'm watching the live feed. Good idea. I'm live? Hey, I'm live. Hey, welcome everybody. We're live. Put your cell phones away. Put your attention right up here on me. You guys are going to learn a ton, hopefully, unless you already know more than I do, which is very possible. About Flash, I'm going to be teaching you guys something that I've been teaching. I've probably talked to about 50,000 photographers at this point uh, through online cap classes, about 1,300 people in person, like coming up, coming over to my house in groups of 15 over the last eight years. I've taught uh, some of this content too. You guys are going to get some stuff that I haven't taught in a lot of places before as well, which is exciting. Come on in to the front row. So my name is Zach Graham, one half of Zach and Jody. Uh, the way better looking half, and this is my family up here. That's my wife, Jody. Uh, my son, Jackson, who is the love of my life. Don't get me talking about him or I'll start crying while we're sitting up here, but he's amazing. He's four and a half. Uh, my little daughter, London Rain, who is uh, the one with the curly hair. No one in my family has curly hair, and she has this insane bouffant, and she always tells me to touch it and that it, and that it feels squishy. She's like, feel my hair, or it's fluffy. My hair's fluffy. And then my uh, newest one, uh, Ember, uh, Hope, and she is a doll. All my kids are the easiest kids of all time to raise. They're super chill, super amazing. And I'm very, very blessed to have uh, this many kids this close together, <laughs> which has been super easy. Um, but it's great. So that's my family. Uh, but I want to tell you guys really quickly before we get started a little bit about uh, my background, where I've come from. Has anybody ever heard me teach or speak before? Nobody? You heard who speak before? Me. Oh, no. No. Nobody. Awesome. OK. Yeah. This I've guy. This guy. <laughs> You've heard this guy before. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we can stay on par with this guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll co-teach together, the two of us. So I'm from a small town in northern Minnesota called Keewatin of 1,000 people. I grew up without a dad. No education, believe it or not, the last time I've been to school is three weeks into the third grade. Uh, didn't go to school growing up. And uh, some people say, how was that possible? I don't know. I just experienced it. Uh, but I grew up in a very depressed place. We didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid. We moved around a lot when I was a kid. We used to open up the oven and turn on a fan sometimes to heat our house in the middle of northern Minnesota because we just didn't have money to pay the heat bill sometimes. And there was a lot riding against me ever moving out of that because everybody I knew was sort of in that similar kind of situation. And I felt like I was uh, the lowest common denominator out of all of those people. And thank goodness one day a youth pastor from my church said, Zach, what are you doing here? Why are you working at a tie store for seven bucks an hour selling ties? And I said, because I don't know what else to do. Nobody's given me any leadership. Nobody ever told me what I could do. And he said, I believe you could do something more. And it was the most amazing. I was 21 years old. I just got my GED, um, and somebody believed in me, and it was life-changing. And ever since that day, which radically changed my life, an hour at lunch with a youth pastor that I didn't even know that well, radically changed the trajectory of my life, and that put me on a path to go, if I ever do anything that's noteworthy, I hope that I can pass that on. I can help someone else to achieve something, to do something bigger than they thought they could do, even if it's just a little bit. If it's be a better dad or a better parent. If I have a little bit of experience with that, could I help somebody with that? I don't have a lot. I've just got a four-year-old. Uh, but I do have experience in what it means to overcome loss. My wife and I lost three children before uh, these, these three were born. And so I know what that's like, uh, to, to keep believing that something can happen even when you've been told it may not even be possible. Uh, to believe that you can start a business, which I never thought I could. To start a business and have $30,000 come in in six months and only make $4,000 profit and to try again, even though you think you're a complete failure. That's what happened to us in 2007 when we started our business. Uh, to have my wife uh, look at me and say, I believe that we can do this again. I believe you have the skills. Even though you don't have that education, I believe that you can read enough business books and that you can do this. We can do something more. And then the next year, to, to listen to people that were successful instead of listening to all the people I used to listen to, which were the unsuccessful people, were telling me what to do, and it wasn't working. I started listening to the most successful people I could find. And before I knew it, two months into 2008, relaunching our business, we netted $100,000 income. And it blew my mind. It opened up my world to thinking, if I can do this, what is, what's, anything is possible. And immediately, I started to believe that what I wanted more than anything wasn't to 
make a lot of money or to, to build a big house or to have fancy cars or any of that stuff. Because I've had all that stuff and none of it made me happy. I was worse off than when I started having all that stuff. But what I wanted more than anything was to make my wife happy. To be a great father, to be a great husband, to be a great friend, to be vulnerable, to be available to people around me, and to pass that to the people that I get to see. And you guys are some of those people right now. You guys listening online, you guys sitting right here, engage with me. I love this. And I hope that I, more than anything, teaching off camera flash, it's great. And I hope it enhances your photography and makes your clients happier. So I'm going to show you how that has worked for us. It's, 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 it's helped our photography a lot. But more than that, to inspire you guys that whatever it is that you decide that you want to do is possible. I don't care who hasn't done it or who is doing it now. If we, I noticed for myself, I grew up very poor, and I used to say things like this all the time. Man, I wish I was lucky like that guy. I wish luck maybe one day. And I realized that was such limiting beliefs in my mind. If I thought maybe I could do something, then maybe I would. But if I said, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do that. And I started recognizing that the people, I was reading these business books by millionaires and billionaires and some of the most uh, successful people on the planet that were never used the kind of language I was using. And they started saying, you know what, when I do this, I'm going to do that. And as soon as I create this, even if it fails, I'm going to do it again. And then I'm going to be a success at this. And those people did it. And I said, I'm going to start thinking and believing like that. So I did that in business for a long time. Just in the last few years, I've been focusing that kind of attitude on my personal life, my relationships, my friendships, putting myself out there, even what I'm doing with you guys, being really, really open is really hard for me. It's the last thing I ever want to do. This is not my nature. But all that to say, my wife and I are very fortunate to make our business very successful in wedding photography for about seven years. And then we started transitioning that into education for photographers. We started building an email list. It's about 65,000 photographers that listen to us every week on the email list. About 65,000 photographers on the Facebook page that we get to have conversations with. Thousands of people that have come to our events over the years. We've been privileged to speak all over the world. Um, it's been an amazing journey. And now we've transitioned into how can we help you with your business. So you'll hear about that a little bit at the end. I got a free giveaway for everybody. Uh, but we created a piece of software that runs your entire business for you and it takes 30 minutes to get it working and it helps you convert more leads, wow your customers and do it without burning out in the process. And that's what every photographer wants. I want to do what I love without having to focus on the stuff that I hate in the business. Who in here wants to make a bunch of money in photography? Well, half of you, okay, the other half just loves photography. That's totally cool too. So just shoot and don't, don't ask for money. Just do it for fun because <laughs> you're going to be way better off. Um, but if you get serious about business, Come find me and I'll help you. I love, I love business. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how do we use off-camera flash in an effective way? And I was talking to, tell me your name again. Craig. Craig. Is that, did I say it right? You did. OK. I was talking earlier and I said, this is what I believe about flash and when it needs to be used. It doesn't matter who you are, what kind of photography you do, whether it's weddings, babies, portraits, photojournalism in the front row right here, shout out. No matter what it is. We need to use flash when we need it because the image just can't do what this sees, right? what we see in our eye, or when we want to create something. That's it. So we shot weddings for a long time. I still shoot weddings here and there on, on occasion. And when we shoot a wedding, I go, does the image that I'm about to shoot need to be better? And can I do it with flash? Is flash going to make it better? Or am I shooting something that I just can't possibly capture well without flash, like the reception? Some receptions you can, very rarely. Some of them, it's like a living nightmare trying to take a, a photojournalistic shot out of reception where it actually looks good and it's sharp. And you can see what's happening. So that's another time when we use flash quite a bit. So today, I'm going to talk with you guys a lot about that stuff. I've got cool free giveaways for everybody as well. Uh, I'm going to give away a couple of hundred dollars worth of stuff to people sitting here. Everybody here and online is going to get something for free uh, that's worth money, which is <laughs> awesome. But anybody can go to this link, bit.ly slash zjflashguide. About 40,000 photographers so far have downloaded this free guide. This is going to be a recap of what I talked to, to you guys about today in a short little 10-page PDF. And it's really cool. It's how to start flashing your, uh, your clients the right way. And uh, it's basically my three-step system that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. And I'm not going to hold anything back, by the way. Sometimes you'll uh, see educators, and I used to do this, where I go, yeah, exactly. she's like, really? Where I go, here's the, 
the three keys to my system and I get key three, go buy my e-course. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to show you guys exactly what to do to get the shots that you're looking for. Uh, so don't worry about that uh, because I'm not interested if you go buy my flash course, which I do have one, but I don't care. Uh, what I care about more is that you feel inspired and empowered to do what you want to do. And I see Ashley, our amazing model, is here. I did say her name right. Did I get it right? Yes, you did. I told everybody to remind me in case I forget. I get into, my wife calls it photo, uh, photo zack or photo mode, mm -hmm. where I literally can't pay attention to anything but how to make the shot look better. And I forget everybody's names. And my wife's memorized everybody's names from the whole bridal party and the whole wedding. And, she's call and I'm like, you on the right, scoot over. <laughs> you don't look right. You know. OK, so download the free flash guide. And now let's talk about some before and after examples, some demonstration of what flash can do for you. I've had the privilege, like I said, to work with Westcott a lot. So some of these images are from workshops. Some are, some are from real weddings, and I'll say when. And some are from demonstrations that I've done, video shoots, where we're showing how to use a particular piece of gear. This is from a video shoot. We were out uh, at these amazing uh, mountains in Colorado. And we were, because of the shooting schedule of the day, we were there at high noon. And anybody that shoots at high noon goes, man, cameras don't work great for this. Yeah. Exposed for the highlights. The shadows are super dark. You can see in this shot, it's the worst of both worlds because it's just a behind the scenes photo. Blown out highlights, dark shadows, and nothing looks that great. But if we use off camera flash the right way, we can sort of create that into whatever we want it to look like. It's amazing. It's amazing what flash can do. And it can look stunning and beautiful. And a lot of times I feel like the pushback sometimes on flash on location is people saying, my client's not going to feel natural in that moment. Well, in my opinion, the naturalness of that client is based on your relationship with them. Right? It's not about what gear you're using and whether you're minimalist or you have a lot of gear like you saw in this shot. It's about that connection with your customer or the connection with your subject if you're not a paid photographer. Either one is fine. But I've realized if you think back, I don't know if we have a camera. Anybody got a twin reflex camera laying around? Probably not. But back in the old days, so let me grab my camera really quick. The worst thing that ever happened to photography, and Canon's not going to love me for saying this, is this. How comfortable do you feel right now? You're like, holy cow, get that out of my face, right? But back in the old days when they had uh, twin reflex cameras, it was like this. Yeah, blah, 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 click. Totally. If you look at one of the best photographers of, of all time, uh, Richard Avedon, right? What did he do all the time? He had a twin reflex. He leaned on his camera with the click shutter release in his finger, and he just had a conversation. Whether it was manipulative or not, because he used to manipulate the daylights out of people to get emotion, or if it was real. It didn't matter. But the point was, is it was going, this is what was going on, and then he was capturing moments, right? Beautiful. Sitting in front of a giant camera with one big, huge flash in the 60s, and he's leaning here having conversations with his clients. Amazing. Like, oh, so amazing. So the challenge is always this, right? So how do we have that great conversation with our customer, get them to feel relaxed? I've noticed if I'm not as close to people, they feel more relaxed in the beginning, and that I can move closer as they trust me. So that's something we do quite a bit. The first shot we always do is with my 70 to 200 at 200 millimeters, and I just have people walk, whether it's flash or not. Just walk. Walk and talk. My friend Mike Larson used to do this all the time. He'd walk up to the client and he'd say, hey, we're just going to start the portrait session. This would usually be on the engagement shoot, which is a great precursor to the wedding to see how things are going to go. They'd say, I want you to do something real simple. Are you guys good at walking? Yeah. And they'd laugh. OK, just hold hands, turn your shoulders towards each other, and just walk, walk towards me. But what I want you to do, and he would say this, he'd say, groom, you know, Bob, I want you to turn to your bride-to-be and just tell, tell her that you have a huge surprise for her. And what's something that you love? And she'll go, shoes. And OK, you bought her her favorite pair of shoes, but she doesn't know. So just talk about that. Try to get her to guess what it is. It's something they already have in common, something she loves, something he knows. He's having fun with her, and they walk. And as they're walking, they're smiling, they're engaging. He's not even in the picture. He, he's like, I don't even care if the photos look good. All I care about is that they feel like photography is natural. It, it feels good. So I, this is not in any of my notes. I normally never talk about this, but I just wanted to say all that with Flash. OK, let's get back to where we were. What I also love about Flash is you can be, this is from a real wedding uh, that my wife and I actually filmed the entire wedding. I was shooting it live, which was crazy. I don't recommend ever doing that. Uh, but it was amazing. And we work with this couple. This uh, bride is actually my nanny to my kids. Mm. And we love her. We love her husband. We've uh, done a lot of stuff with them over the years. And we said, we'd love to photograph your wedding and film it, if you'll let us. And we, they love the off-camera flash stuff because they just are really into it. So 
This is literally just at the top of the hill by my house where their wedding was. And it was amazing to be able to shoot this really stunning portrait. This is in the middle of the afternoon, right? This is like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we were able to shoot this stunning portrait using one off-camera flash, uh, similar to the one you're seeing right here today, a little bit smaller version of it, and create this outstanding portrait for them. And now this is hanging up uh, in their house, which I love. I love all my clients love a photograph, and they want to put it up. And they're, they happen to be really beautiful people, so the really like stoic look is like totally them. Uh, which is cool. What I also love about off-camera flash is I can go find a simple background that I think is interesting. Maybe it has some cool light on it, but the, the ambient light for my subject, the portrait light, isn't good. So it doesn't look good at all. But I can bring in a flash and I can paint light in exactly where I want it to and make it look outstanding. So I'm still using the light in the background, but now I'm painting this beautiful light onto our bride's face. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Love it. Smooth. Say that again? That one was uh, just like this. Yeah, and I'll show you guys how to take like even a big light and feather it and paint it in if you want to or blast it at them and light everything up if you, if you so choose. Are you looking for a seat, my dear? There's one right there. Feel free to grab it. No, that's totally fine. I'm happy there's a lot of people here. This is great. Uh, same thing, out on location in the mountains, shooting. Again, can't control the time that we get to shoot all the time. Um, so we had really, really brutal lighting. Uh, but I wanted, same thing, you notice me using these quite a bit. This is the Rapid Box from uh, Westcott. I love this because it opens and closes super fast. That's why they call it Rapid, Rapid Box, instead of having to put it all together. It just pops open like an umbrella and pops closed, so it's very quick and easy to travel with. So this is using the Rapid Box and a little strip bank in the background. Um, behind it was these beautiful mountains, and the background looks great in high contrast if we can tone it down a little bit and control the highlights. And this is what it looked like before. And I was like, this is not awesome. Uh, can we make this look better? And then I photographed this using those two lights. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, 99.9% .9 of my stuff has never seen the inside of Photoshop. It's only Lightroom and it's very minimal adjustments. A little bit of retouching. I'm not replacing backgrounds. I'm not doing any weird color gradations or anything like that. This is pretty much how I shoot it in the camera. And that's kind of been a big thing for me is I don't want to photograph something and then have to spend hours upon hours working on it because I was a wedding photographer and when you deliver 700 final photos, which brides want, it's hard to, to, to do that to 700 photos. I could do the entire wedding in about two and a half hours flat, all the editing, everything. Um, and I can teach you how to do that too. It's another workshop. Same thing here. Taking a location that may not be incredible, uh, but if we add a little bit of light to it, and this one has two little speed lights in the background lighting up the top of that salt barn and then a flash on the front, and then another flash on the back. So there's four lights on this to make this effect. Yeah, the little speed lights are just lighting that up. This was late in the day. The sun was setting, uh, but incredible. It seems compli complicated and hard, but it's really not. I'm going to show you today how to do one light here, right here in the studio, and hopefully it looks awesome, uh, and then how to add two or three more lights to it and make it super easy to do. I'm all about simple and easy. I like that. Same thing with the groom. Getting the groom to trust you and to love you because you made him look cool. Sometimes that's really important. I remember we are photographing a wedding uh, one time and the groom refused to let me uh, come and shoot any getting ready photos. He didn't want any, any to, I think it was just too intimate or too something. He said, nope, I'll show up dressed, we'll take a few shots and then I'm gonna go get married. Leave me alone. He was very much that attitude, which is not normally how we work with people. And I remember he showed up we are at the location, I'm waiting for him. He got out of the car and he goes, so are we gonna take a few photos or what? <laughs> and I was like, what am I gonna have to do to make this guy trust me? <laughs> am I gonna, so I'm, I'm bantering with him, I'm trying to chat with him. He's, sometimes people are just, their headspace is so far somewhere else. He's about to get married, it's a big deal. And I'm just like, what am I gonna do? So I'm like, okay, I, I'm gonna do a flash shot. It was exactly like this, 45 degree lighting, which I love on men. I'm going to make him look masculine. He was a very masculine, like, looked like he drove a big pickup truck kind of guy, mm -hmm. you know. I lean him up against the wall, and I, and I, I got down like this, put my flash to the side. The yeah, I, I got down to the side like this, and I said, just look, look at me like you want to hurt me. And he goes, no problem. <laughs> I swear, that's exactly what he said. And I went, click, and I turned the camera around, and he goes, oh, I look cool. He thought he wasn't going to look cool, whatever that meant to him. And he started laughing, he let his guard down, I shot a bunch of candids that the bride is gonna love, and it was amazing. 
Um, so Flash can do that as well. It can, it can get you out of a sticky situation, is my point. Uh, sometimes, if there's great ambient light, I use it, right? But you can also take that ambient light and create something like this. Just one flash, off to camera left, feathered off, so I can capture everybody's faces correctly exposed. It can do both. It can go from this to this. And I love that about Flash as well. Or this. You know, this was a very important portrait of the, bra uh, sorry, the groom, his, his best man and his brother. It was very important for him to have this very cool photo of the, of the three of them together. He, he, this was actually on his list. He said, I want a very stoic portrait of us looking like men. It was whatever that meant, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can also use off-camera flash to create really outrageous, cool-looking photos that are different, atmospheric or strange, or, or what I sometimes call anti-lighting, right? The opposite of correct lighting. And I'll show you guys more of that coming up. You can shoot the bride as well when we have these brutal high noon uh, times. You can see that's the same flash as you see right here, the same modifier, and create just really beautiful looking photos of the bride. As long as we have that good connection, we can get that, that nice expression coming out of her. She doesn't feel forced or awkward. It can look fantastic. Same thing here. You can actually make flash look more organic as well. So you can have that beautiful light coming in from the background if we know how to blend that light together, but then still put beautiful light on the front. You can take locations like this. I was here just a few weeks ago in New York. I'm from Nashville, by the way. I was here just a few weeks ago, and I was, uh, we were doing a video shoot for we uh, Westcott and Ellen Chrome, uh, show showcasing some of these new lights. And I was just walking around, and I saw this little grate, and I was like, that looks cool. If we put flash on you can see with me there, it's terrible, right? <laughs> if we put some flash on this, this could look great. So we set up the flash. We put one flash, as you can see, in the background to sort of warm up the background and give it like a nice... Uh, uh, gelled color because there's an orange tungsten gel on it. And then what we did was we photographed that in that simple location with just one light in the front, one light in the back. This is what it looked like with no flash on it. And by the way, the exact same retouching is on both of these photos. You can see with beautiful soft light, it fills in all the minute uh, flaws and it makes them, it, she doesn't have a lot, but it makes them look that much better. And then here's one where we added, and I'll show you guys this coming up, the highlighter. And it wasn't this particular one, but it was just a little reflector underneath to pop some light under the eyes so you can see it really well in, the, in, the, in, her, in her eyes right there. Okay, and by the way, for those of you watching online, for those of you sitting here, this is really cool. Westcott has teamed up with Adorama, and they're doing this amazing thing. If you buy any of their products, right? Is that right, Dave? Any product? Dave? Any, any Westcott product. Any Westcott product. You will be entered into this drawing between February 23rd or now until May 23rd, and one winner is going to win, let me read this correctly, two round trip tickets to Nashville from anywhere in the United States, which is an amazing place, two nights in a hotel, two days of meals and transportation, an eight hour intensive workshop one on one with me, and $1,500 in Westcott free products. So you could buy, you know. What's well, the cheapest thing they have? A reflector. Did you know. they make keychains? Yeah, did they make keychains? Yeah, I mean, you could spend 30 or 40 bucks, but go spend 1,000 because their products are great. Um, and you can be entered to win this. Uh, they just did one with another photographer, and I guess it was really cool. So you get to come, hang out at my house. We'll go shoot if you want to shoot, or if you want to talk business and blow your business up, we can do that. Um, I've consulted a lot of photographers from zero to even the seven figure mark. If you want to get to anywhere in between, I can help you do that. I can point you in the right direction. I've been doing it for a long time. This is really cool. Uh, by the way, if you want to enter, just go to this link, bit.ly slash win a day with Zach. Westcott sent me another link, and it was a hard one to remember, so I, I created my own. Um, but go to that link, bit.ly slash win a day with Zach. And we'll get to do this, but you'll be the one shooting the whole time, and I'll be looking over your shoulder, or we'll look at your pricing structure and your website and your branding and marketing, and we'll, we'll work on it for the whole day. It'll be, it'll be awesome. And normally I charge, I do these quite a bit. I charge about $5,000 to do a one-on-one -on -one for eight hours. So that's my normal rate, and I do them quite often. I have a couple of coaching clients right now that I'm working with. Uh, but I'd love to do that for free with one of you guys and, and help you do whatever it is you want to do, business or photography. Everybody got the link? Sweet. Okay, let's get into it, right? Let's get rocking and rolling. And as we go, we're going to bring Ashley up. Uh, and back just to do some demonstrative stuff, and then we'll have a specific time where we're going to shoot a live demo. We're going to shoot it up to the screen so you can see what's happening in the camera as I shoot. And if, if what I tell you is true, the first or second shot, or third, 
should be pretty darn close to money if, if we follow my system correctly, okay? And that's the goal. We don't want to try to, I like having a great baseline. This is exactly where I wanted to start from. And then if you want to tweak and finesse from there, you can. Instead of like starting somewhere and it's terrible and now we're trying to figure out how to fix it. I don't like that. Yeah, exactly. I like you. <laughs> Front row like feedback, like this is great. A lot of nodding and smiling, awesome. Okay, so key number one. Oh, and by the way, if you see a link pop up, that's because I'm giving you a guide to all the gear that I use or all the something. There's something free there. Uh, so if you go to bit.ly slash ZJ gear guide, you can get access. I have a whole page built of all the equipment that I use with links to Adorama, of course. Uh, to go buy any of those products uh, or check them out or find out more information. But I have descriptions, how I use them, sometimes videos, before and after examples of, of those things, and then you can make a decision on that's right for you and your photography. So key number one, if you're taking notes, and I see some of you are, which is awesome, because you only retain 7% of what you hear. Um, if you write it down, you retain closer to 20%, which is great. But key number one is the right light. And a lot of people go, well, if I'm doing flash, what do I need? And really, my opinion on the right light is knowing what's out there, and then what is it that I'm trying to accomplish. So when I say the right light, to me, it's about what's right for you. So we've got a photojournalist here. Who in here does like studio portraits? Anybody shoot any studio portraits? Number of you. Big difference on what you might or might not need, right? In a studio setting, I might need a seven-foot octobank and a little snoot. If I'm shooting photojournalism, I might just need a speed light with a little modifier on it when I happen to need a little extra light coming from camera right. And that's it, because you're a minimalist, right? So it's really important to figure out what is it that I need. So a couple of pieces of gear that I've used a lot and that you've seen a lot of the photos that I've been showing you. This is a Westcott 24 by 32 softbox, about 140, 160 bucks, depending on the promotion at the time. This is a really good, bulletproof, simple tool. It's about this big, and it looks outstanding. I use the Westcott Rapid Boxes a lot now these days. These are a newer product from Westcott, last few years. And what I'm looking for when it comes to a soft box is quality. Write that down. Quality of light. What that means is it doesn't mean the light is necessarily soft. It means it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? So with a soft box, the light should be coming out evenly. So therefore, it's soft. Because a large light source equals soft. Not diffusion. Diffusion has nothing to do with softness. It has to do with size. The bigger the light, the softer it is. The softer the transition from highlight to shadow if it's at the right distance. So that's the goal. Softness with the softbox. Some softboxes will specifically say, if you read like the, like the little details on it, the fine print, it'll say there's a half stop fall off from center to edge. What does that mean? That means there's a hot spot in the center of some kind which means even though it looks this big, it's actually about that big, right? So that's what's key here. And what I've found by using Westcott product for 10 years is that the, the light comes out, especially of these. These are designed to come out very evenly. They come out very soft. The cool thing about these, these boxes, and I'll show you guys this really quick. So if you look inside this, and forgive me for stepping back out of the light here for a sec, so I can raise this up. They have a couple of ways that they achieve this. One is by diffusion, right? Diffusion is just going to scatter the light and help it to come out eat more evenly out the front. Two layers of diffusion helps to do that better. But what's really cool about the Rapid Box is one, the design does that really well, the way it's an octobank. It helps the light to come out like this and wrap around your subject. It forces more light out of the sides, so it comes out more evenly, a little bit less in the center if you use this cool thing, which is called a deflector dish. So this basically turns it into a beauty dish. So what it does is instead of that direct light, which is still only this big, it's not much bigger than a speed light using this big, powerful flash, it comes out, hits this, and pushes the light around like this. So there's a little bit of a dead spot here, a little less light here, a little more uh, light here, and it wraps around the face. So it looks amazing, right? What's great about that is instead of the light coming out flat and hitting you here and then getting darker as it tapers back, which can create a hot spot on the face if it's really close, this helps wrap that light around your face. So the times when I'll actually use something like this deflector dish is if I'm moving it really close and I'm doing like a beauty shot. If it's further away, it's an added on uh, item for like 20 or 30 bucks or something like that. Um, but if you're doing anything from this distance, I don't use it because the light does come out beautifully evenly. And if it's moved a little bit further away, you don't have to worry about that tapering of the light. So that's what's really powerful about this. 
uh, particular setup. And like I said, it's a rapid box, so it's uh, just like an umbrella. There's a little magnet piece on the back. You just go, and it pops closed, and it's, you can, you're ready to rock. Go somewhere else with it. I'm going to close this up so it's not a big eyesore. OK, cool. Just move this back a little bit. Hopefully, that's not totally in the way. And we'll get the logo in there. Wes Scott will like that. OK, so what's the right light for you? So here's an example of that light. It's not a huge light. This is really old. This photo, by the way, is like nine years old. So this is my wife shooting, as you can see, using an old school like battery inverter uh, from, we don't use this stuff anymore. It was super heavy. Now you can get, now this does the exact same thing. Right? It's, like, it's like a purse, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's literally a battery uh, from a, like a car battery. <laughs> it's crazy. But here's the effect, right? That one little flash can create this beautiful light over our subject. It's amazing, OK? Now, if you're on the other end of this, minimalistic, and you want soft light, you can use something like the Rapid Box. These come in 20 and 26 inch sizes, so they're this big in diameter. Very, very minimalistic. We use these a ton for reception lighting, for low light portraits, indoor portraits, that kind of stuff. Phenomenal for that. So you can see here we were photographing a wedding. The bride and groom decide to get married right as the sun's setting. Perfect, the light's going to be awesome. Guess what happens? The whole wedding's 30 minutes late. Go figure. So now the video guy is off to the camera right here shooting his orange light up their nose. And the background's getting epically dark. And I'm like, I'm, I can't photograph this. But of course, I'm thinking ahead. And I'm going, this might happen. So I have my rapid box set up and two little speed lights in the background like this. The shot you just saw was when my flash happened to not fire. Um, luck, lucky shot. And then I, instead, I was able to capture this. So we. Even though it wasn't what I wanted, which was that beautiful sunset romantic glow, we got something that they loved. And it was beautiful. And I could shoot this all night, even if the sun was gone, completely gone, which happened later, and still get beautiful shots. And some of them had the lights in it like that. Some of them ha didn't have the lights in it. So that's preferential. Oh, speed lights. Yeah, those are just little speed lights in the background on stands. Yep. So key number two, once you figure out what light you want, you want harsh light, you want soft light, you want big lights, you want small lights, make sure they're good quality, it's doing what you want them to do. And go to my link that I sent you, and you're going to find a lot of options. Next is the right ratios of light, because there is no right ratio. When I say ratio, I mean the flash you're using and whatever else you're using. So you're using a flash, and maybe you're using other flashes, or you're using the flash, and you're mixing it with ambient existing light. The ratio of light that you choose to use is going to define your style. Do you like natural and pretty, and you just want a little kiss of flash to open up the, the eyes? Or do you want a ton of flash and the background really dark, and it's edgy, and you're shooting album covers and rock star photography or whatever? That's totally up to you. I'm going to show you how to get those ratios the click of a button. You're going to love me for this. But here's an example. Here's a shot. Uh, and this is a series of images from the exact same wedding, uh, similar time of day, so you can see. This is what's called a 3 to 1 lighting ratio. And what you see here is. The light that's on them is just a little bit brighter than the light that was already there. So even though this is clearly a flash shot, it's not crazy. It could be a reflector, right? It doesn't look over the top flash heavy. The background still looks pretty. You still see that beautiful ambient light back there. But what that means when I say three to one light is just the flash on them is twice as bright as the existing light. That's it. And we can get into ratios, and I can get super nerdy and technical, but that really doesn't help anybody. If you really want to know, I can answer any super dorky lighting techo, technique, tech, techie questions. Uh, but just know the flash on them is twice as bright as the flash in the background. Very simple ratio. And you can do the reverse of this. You can have the ambient light be the dominating light source and just have a teeny bit of flash in there as well. But I don't really shoot much of that, so I don't have a lot of examples. This, on the other hand, that you saw earlier, this is called 5 to 1 lighting, where the flash is now another stop brighter than the ambient light. So the ambient light is two stops dark. And what happens is they start to look like I inserted them on the background. Right? It starts to look a little fake. I love this look. This, this is something I really love. The trick with these is being careful where the fall off of light is. If there's a lot of light hitting the ground and you see that, it looks like a lot of flash. And if you don't like that, you've got to be careful for that. So sometimes you have to feather the light or adjust the light so it doesn't happen. I'll show you how to do that coming up. But I love this look. It's a different look. It's more dramatic, uh, but it's very cool. And then this, this is called 9 to 1 lighting. So the ambient light is now three stops underexposed and the flash is filling in the difference. And the light that you actually see coming in from camera right that looks like sunset is actually another flash, because the sun had already set. 
So it would have just been really dark on this, but I wanted it to look like, kind of mimic what the sun would have looked like that was hitting the sky and hitting them at the same time. Now, even though it's not hitting the trees in the background, which kind of gives it away if you're real techie, you would notice that, but you see a little bit in the background. Um, so it looks like the sun was kind of peeking through for a second. And that's, that's that effect. So you can make these decisions. Do I want a teeny bit of flash? Do I want obvious flash? Do I want it dramatic? Or I do, do I want it hyper dramatic like this? And anywhere in between. All right. We're already to key three. This is where it gets easy. And then I got to, after this, I'm going to show you guys this. We'll, we'll do an example of setting all this up with Ashley. Uh, we won't shoot just yet. I may take a few shots, but we won't tether it. I'll do that at the end. And then I'm going to show you guys a bunch of cool tricks. Like, hey, what if I want to do this? Or what if I want to do that? Or what if I want to do this? Once you know the basics, everything else gets super easy. And there's a few seats for those of you in the back. If you want, there's two here, and there's one there. If you want to come in, don't be scared. Or they could pull seats from right there if, somebody, if Dave wants to grab some seats and let these guys hop in the back. OK, key number three, the most important part, is the right system. So how do we make this just work every time? So before we get into the system, we want to talk about three elements like uh, I've been mentioning already. One is that quality of light. What are you trying to replicate? Specular light, daytime light at the right angle, soft, beautiful window light. What are you trying to replicate? What quality of light are you trying to emulate? Key number two is the right height. People get confused about this a lot. There's technical right, and then there's I'm experimenting heights. So an example of this would be if you have a soft box or a light source of any kind like this, some people go, well, where do I put, how high do I put this thing? Where should it go? And the easiest thing to get it in the technically, technically correct place is to take the center of the light source and put it just slightly above the center of the eyes. Because we want the shadows on the nose are really the telltale sign of correct lighting. Where are they falling? And when the light is just above the center of the eyes, we get these shadows falling right into the lip correctly where they're supposed to be. And then we can experiment from there. What we don't want to do is have it too low, and we're lighting up someone's chest and their face is dark. Or have it too low. Yeah, question. Yeah, the shadows part? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, so if, if the light is in the correct place, the shadows will fall down into the center of the lip correctly. And I don't have examples of all this because we don't have my eight-hour eight class that I do on this. But there's uh, lighting patterns called like butterfly lighting. It looks like a little butterfly is under the nose, right? Or loop lighting, where that light is looping off to one side. Or 45 degree lighting, where as we move the light this way, the shadow then connects on this side. And if it connects through the lip, it doesn't look right. If it connects sideways, it looks like strange. If the light's too low, light's shooting up their face, and we call that scary movie lighting, right? It can look cool if we have a lot of light up here and a little bit of light down here. But if we shoot it from down here, they're going to look terrifying. And if that's the goal, maybe you're shooting Halloween photos and you want them to look like that. That's when we break the rules. But technical portrait lighting, we want that shadow in, in this range, right? And we do that by making sure the center of the light source is above the center of the eye. So above the center of the eye. Center of the eye, right? Because we want that catch light just above the pupil, right? If you're using a small light source, that means the light has to go higher. If you're using a large light source, that light source would come down a little bit lower. Does that make sense? No. Well, because a tiny, tiny little light source, the center of it is going to be here, and it's going to have that more chance to shoot across the center of the, uh, across the face like this. If I have a light source this big, some of the light's going to be down here, some of some here, but the majority is going to be in this range, so we're still going to get the shadows falling in the correct place. Does that make sense? Versus where the fill's coming in. Does that make sense? And I'll show you. I will demonstrate this, and I'll show you how incredible it's going to look just using this simple technique. Usually what I do a lot, if, I, if I'm standing right here and I have an average medium-sized softbox, I'll just raise it up and I'll get my eye li line in line with my subject, and I'll raise it up till the bottom of the box hits their chin. And that's about money every time, every single time. If I'm at the same height and I get to, the, to that point, it's going to look phenomenal. Does no matter if they're sitting or standing? Doesn't matter. So if I was photographing you mm -hmm. and I had my softbox right here, I'd get down to your height, I'd raise it up to the bottom of it, hit your chin, and boom, it would look perfect. So you have like a modeling light on besides the sound. You don't need the model. See, so outside, if you're shooting on location, turn a modeling light on, and it's high noon, you're not going to see it anyway. So it's useless. But with the softbox not on or flashing, you can see where the shadow light is? Exactly. As long as that center of the light is above the center of the eyes slightly, it's going to be perfect. So I don't even use modeling lights in the studio. I never have. You can, and they're great because you can go, oh, look, at, there's the light's perfect, right? Right there. And that is from the reflection of the white. 
Exactly. Well, you can turn on a modeling lamp on any of these lights and it'll just put on a, like a constant light and then you can see what the light's actually doing as it's coming out. But if you just use this technical way that I'm telling you, center lights are slightly above the center of the eyes, it's perfect. Looks awesome. I'll show you. Last one is direction. Okay? What direction of light do we want the light to be coming in from? Now there's a lot of directions of light based on what you're trying to accomplish. I'm going to talk about four of them really quick. If you're taking notes, write them down. Number one is glamour light. So tell me your name again, my dear. What? Tell me your name again. Angeline. Angeline. If Angeline was my model or my subject and I was photographing her and I want to do glamour lighting, the lighting would be straight on, right? And I'd be right underneath my light. Glamour lighting or butterfly lighting because it creates a butterfly effect under the nose because the light's coming straight like this and it's creating a little shadow like this. The reason they call it glamour lighting back in the 20s is because they use it on glamour models. Super beautiful people. It's very flat. You can move it a little bit higher and it'll create some rounder features under the chin, but it shows the entire face and the entire body if they're standing straight towards the camera. So you have to keep in mind, you want to have somebody with great skin, probably pretty, probably skinny, because it's not going to thin them, it's not going to do them any favors, if you know what I'm saying, okay? So keep glamour lighting for glamorous people a lot of the time. Then we can move the light about 30 to 35 degrees to one side and we get what we call loop lighting. So if their face is still straight to the camera, we move the flash this way. Now that shadow is going to loop off to the side. This is great for just about anybody, especially women, because it creates a highlight on one side, a shadow on the other, and we can highlight and hide. Right? We can make people look thinner by 20 to 30 percent, depending on the ratio of light, and it's phenomenal. Then we move into one of my favorites, which is called 45 degree lighting. We simply move the flash to 45 degrees. They're still looking straight at me. What this is going to do is it's going to highlight a smaller section of their face and body. And the shadow on the far side, as we move the light, that shadow is going to go like this. It's going to connect over here and create a little diamond effect over this, the far eye. What's great about this is it looks masculine on men and it creates this smoky, mysterious effect on women, depending on the ratio. Heavy, heavy ratio, five to one, nine to one, like I talked about earlier, it's gonna look really dramatic. If it's just three to one or fill light, it's just gonna look pleasant, right? The last one, which is my favorite and I use on women all the time, is called uh, short lighting. So this is one of the best lights to use on women. Hands down, it's pretty much my go-to lighting. So what short lighting is, is if I have my, and I'll demonstrate this with, you know what, let's bring Ashley up here real quick, if you don't mind, my dear. Big round of applause for Ashley, everyone. Isn't she beautiful? I only work with beautiful people, so. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay, so if you don't mind standing just right here and turning towards everyone else. So, we'll demonstrate this again using a small light. This could be like a speed light or just a small modifier. The first one we mentioned was glamour light, right? Straight on like this. Uh, center of the light source just above the center of the eyes. Can be any of these distances depending on the effect you're going for. Then we had loop lighting, right, like this. And if we turned off all the lights in here, I could show you the effect. Uh, but for the purposes of streaming in the studio, we can't do that. Um, 45 degree lighting, the light would simply be here and it would create that diamond effect over this side. And then the last one, which is my favorite and that I'll use on Ashley, even though she doesn't need it because she's already skinny and pretty and beautiful, is we keep the light similar to this effect, 30 to 45 degrees off to one side, but I have her turn her body that way Lean on her back leg always, typically. Other leg, perfect. And then have her turn her face back to me. What this does is, notice from your guys' perspective, we have a broad side of the face and a short side of the face. That's what they call it technically. Least, most. Well, we just light the least side. We'll have a little bit of light on the, this side, but most of the light is on this side. Hence the term short lighting. The reason we turn the body away from the light is so that Spin the other way for me, turn towards me, and then keep your face this way. If I lit her this way, and say she wasn't super thin or didn't have a small waist, I would showcase the whole front of her body with the light. If she turns away, you could do that again for me, and then turns her face back. Now I'm just lighting this part that the camera doesn't see as much. And this, if we're trying to m minimize this, is going to go into the shadows, and it's going to take tons of size off of her. And I'm going to highlight the best feature, right? As a photographer, I never say, uh, you don't look good, I'm going to try to make you look better. That's not, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to highlight the best part of you, right? So we light her like this, 
most of the light's going to be here, some of the light here, some of the light here, but most of it back here. And now we have short lighting. And I've got some examples coming up of some short lighting to show you, but it's phenomenal. Thank you. I'll bring you back in a minute. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yeah. So just Jerry Giona says this all the time. Body away, face towards the light. And then lean in a little. You know, it looks amazing. OK, so here's some examples. So we've got a good quality light source. This is a candid series of photographs that my wife, Jody shot during a real wedding. The bride came out of her bridal suite. She had lost like 50 or 60 pounds for the wedding. She was stoked. She looked amazing. She still had some of this going on in her arms from where she had, because she had lost a lot of weight fast. But she looked beautiful. She has beautiful skin, beautiful features. So we wanted to go, how can we showcase the best parts of her? The bride happened to walk out of the bridal suite and was walking down these stairs. And there was a window, just like a softbox like this, shooting light down, as you can see, right there. And notice that light's coming down at a 45 degree angle. That's what light does when you, when you launch it off. It comes down like that. So as she started to step into the light, we notice we have soft, beautiful light. But this is not a, a flattering photograph, right? You see the light on her face. You see her arm. See what's going on there? Not good. She never saw this photo, by the way. She's maybe seen it now that I've been teaching about it um, for like five years. Then she takes another step. And now we're kind of lighting her in the stomach chest area. The light's getting a little better on her face, but it's not perfect. So we have good quality light. We have good direction, actually. Even though her body's into the light, her face is short lit, right? Because we're lighting the least amount of her face, and there's shadows on the, the side that's closer to the camera. But now we just need her to get into that premium spot. Now watch what happens when I go from this image to the next one, where she goes into the primo spot. Boom. It trims her down. Look at her arm. She happened to just move her arm back candidly. Uh, if we were posing her, we would have done that on purpose, move it out of the light source so it doesn't show right, that extra stuff that was going on. It's hiding all of that stuff. And all of a sudden, she looks stunningly beautiful. This is, this is how we saw her. She looks slim. She looks trim. It's the right angle. And we photographed her most of the day like this as much as we possibly could. And she just was stoked. She was one of those brides who said, I know you guys try to sell albums to everybody. I'm not buying one. I said, OK, I'm going to build you one anyway, and you're going to buy it. She was like, we'll see. So she came over to the preview session. I built her like a 40-page album. She bought it that day. <laughs> but it was because of this. It's because we knew how to do this really well. OK, we'll get into the system in a second. So now we got the quality, the height, the direction. We got that in our heads. How am I doing on time here? Siconic light meter is my best friend with off-camera flash. Yes, you can use ETTL and TTL. Yes, you can use high-speed sync. Um, I'm still a little old school, and I like consistency. There's some flashes out there that can give that to me, and there's some that aren't. And I'm not going to just say, hey, buy this one, which costs $2,000, and then you can do what I'm going to show you. I want to show you what anybody can do. If you've never used a meter, they're very simple. You just need to know what you're metering, and that's the metering mode, which is, are you metering ambient or flash? And we're going to be metering flash since we're using flash. So we set that to flash. Next is shutter speed, just like your camera. 125 means 1 1 25th of a second. Simple, right? This is the f-stop. The flash will tell you how bright your light is based on the other two readings, the ISO reading. And it's going to tell you how, how much flash is coming out, the reading. This one says 5.63. And some of you go, my camera only says 5.6. You can change that setting in the meter itself, so it just says 5.6. This is reading in tenths instead of thirds, like a lot of us have our cameras set up to. Then the last one is the ISO. We're going to set this manually, and it's so easy, it's going to blow your mind what this is going to do. The last one, this is radical. Like when I found this out years ago, this changed the pace at which I was able to photograph uh, on location stuff. And what this is, is it's called the flat. And I keep looking over here, which I probably shouldn't be. Maybe I should be looking that way. Um, this is the flash percentage. What this does is anytime you take a reading, say you're outside, and this is for outdoor on location, right? You're outside, you take a flat, you put the flash up at the right height, you got a great quality light, the right height, the right direction for your subject. Now you want to blend it with the ambient light. And you go, this is where everybody gets tripped up. Because I got to do math. Take an ambient light exposure. It's 2.8 at ISO 400 at f5.6 at 1 one hundredth of a second. And now I need my flash to do what again? It gets confusing, right? It gets confusing. Even for people that are really good at it, it takes time. 
So what we want is a faster way to figure it out, or to get close and then modify from there. So what this does is you put it on flash mode, you take a reading, flash goes off, and the meter reads the ambient and the flash and tells you the difference. The ratio. Duh, it's amazing. So that 50% is the flash. What when it says 50%, it's saying 50% flash, 50% ambient. It's an equal mix, yeah. Yeah. Versus 7.1, which is more Great question. So the question from the back was, if you have your flash set up and it says 7.1 or 5.6, which one is more flash power? Is that correct? Is that what you asked? So 5.6 would be less flash power. 7.1 would mean you'd have to close down your aperture down to 7.1 to let less light in because more light's coming out. Does that make sense? OK, cool. So. What you need to know with ratios are just three of them really quick, the ones I showed you earlier. 60%, 70%, 80%. That's 3 to 1, 5 to 1, 9 to 1. If you want minimalist flash, just a little bit of flash, 30% or 40%, anywhere in there. What that means is if, it, if this goes from 50 to 60, so if it said 50 and I wanted to say 60, I just turn my flash up twice as bright. It would say 60 on the next one. And now I would know I'm 60% flash, 40% ambient, or my flash is twice as bright as the ambient every time. Every 10% is one stop of power, twice as much or half as much. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Very simple. So if you're like, I'm dramatic, I like drama, go to 70 or 80% every time, power that flash up or down until it reads 80% or 70%. Whatever it says on, that th on the meter, put it in your camera and take a picture and it'll look epic every time. Is that a flash itself? Or just it's, just a, it's just reading the light. And the big difference between this and what's in your camera is your camera has what's called a reflective light meter. It means it can only read light bouncing off of something. It doesn't read actual light. An incident light meter, which I happen to have, of course, this reads actual light. It reads the light coming out of there and hitting this. So it's hyper accurate, and it works like magic every time. You're like, I don't want another piece of equipment. This will save you tons of time. It's amazing. <clears throat> OK. So here we go. Here's the process. This seems like a lot of stuff. It's not. It's stuff we've already talked about. So first, pick the lighting pattern. What's going to work best for my client? Set up your strobe, meaning the height, the direction, all that stuff, right? Now set the meter uh, ISO to 1 100th of a second every time. Put the ISO on your meter to 1 100th. I don't know why it doesn't say that on here. It's supposed to say that. Fixed it. Sorry. Set your meter ISO to 100, which is your best quality setting. If you're a Nikon shooter, that's probably 200, because that's their base ISO set up to 200. If we want to talk about base ISOs for a while, we can, but we don't have time. Um, set the shutter speed on your meter to 100. And don't worry about why. I'm going to show you why in a second. Then take a meter reading. So if I turn my meter on at any time, it's always 100 to 100. Right? This is for manual flash. This is not for auto flash or TTL, any of that stuff. Then you just check the percentage on the meter. Where do I put the flash? Right at my subject's chin, right? right where I'm trying to meter the light from. Point it right towards your camera or towards the flash. That's totally up to you. If my flash is really dramatic, I'll point it towards the flash. If it's not so dramatic, I'll point it towards the camera. Okay? Now power your strobe up or down until you get to the desired ratio. 30, 40 percent, or 60, 80, 90, whatever you like, whatever is your thing, okay? Then set your camera to that reading. Take awesome photos. It's, literally, it's that easy. I'm telling you. Now, this is the cool thing. You can now adjust your shutter speed. This is why we set the shutter speed to 100, to a, a preference of ratio. And you don't have to worry about, like, high-speed sync settings and any of that crazy stuff. This is the easiest way to do it. This is what I mean. Here's an example. The shutter speed does not affect the flash exposure. As long as you don't go too fast on a manual flash, which means your shutter went so fast it can't see the flash coming out. On Canon, that's usually around 200th of a second. On Nikon, 250th. As long as you're not hitting that, you can do a lot of adjustment right on the fly in the camera to make the background change. And this is really cool. Uh, and that's why we set the shutter speed to 100 because now we have the ability to go up in speed or down in speed. If you started at the highest sync speed, 
If you wanted a darker background, you'd have to change everything and start over. So here's an example. All these are shot at ISO 50 at f4.5. This is at 60th of a second, 1 100th of a second, and 1 200th of a second. See the background? See all the differences you can do? You can slow the shutter speed down and make it less dramatic. You can speed it up and make it more dramatic. But the flash exposure stays the same on the face. The shadows get darker, but the brightness of the flash stays the same. Does that make sense? Very cool. Place the meter there, right? Right there on that part of the face, OK? Now you guys are going to see a quick video of me doing this in real time so you can see how fast it is. Can you show a video? Here it goes. Oh, hang on, hang on. Let's try that again. I think this video takes a second to start. There we go. So this is me shooting a real wedding and photographing in real time. I went up, took a quick meter reading. I got it to 60, 70% because they like drama. These guys are more dramatic. Pulled back, photographed my first image, checked the ratio, made a quick adjustment, sped up my shutter speed for a little more drama, and then I shot the next image. Yeah, I'll talk about that as well. And that's exactly what came out of my camera, right there. That simple. Right height, right modifier, right angle, slightly off to camera left, right ratio, a little bit of drama, boom, that fast. And now that I've got it set, as long as my flash to subject ratio stays the same, I can go shoot anywhere as long as the ambient light doesn't change. But if it does, I can just adjust my shutter speed to control it. Very cool. Any questions about that? I'm yes. So yes. You, you, you uh, kept everything the same, but you changed your um, shutter speed, and it made the sky more dramatic. Where I thought if you lowered it and kept it, you know, open longer, it would absorb more of the ambient. Yeah, you're exactly right. So you, it goes both ways. So we set it to a hundredth of a second. So the question was, the what 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 I'm saying about ambient light and the shutter effect, right? So if you're at a hundredth of a second and you take a shot and you go, man, this is cool, but I don't want as much drama. I want less contrast. Slow the shutter speed down. Yeah, you're exactly correct. You're going to absorb more ambient light, twice as much as if you go from, say, 100 to 50th of a second. And you're going to have less of a ratio. So yes, more light will come into the camera. If you want the more drama, the background to be darker, you could go from 100 to 200, speed it up, and then create more contrast, more darkness in the background. Yes. Make sense? Cool. All right. So now we're going to talk about some studio lighting techniques, and then we're going to do a, a demo. OK, so a couple of cool things. I'm going, to, I'm going to speed this up a little bit, but you guys can all get a copy of my slides if you want them as well. Um, so one light source in the studio. This is just like shooting right here, which we're going to do. We don't have an outdoor studio to shoot in today, so we're going to, I'm going to talk through this to show you how to apply the same principles in the studio and add more lights if you so choose. And the one benefit is we don't have to deal with the ambient light. We just have to deal with the, the flash itself, which is actually easier. So one light source, what can it do? If we move our flash closer to the background, we get the effect on the left. If we move it further away from the background, we get the effect on the right. Very simple. Or you can feather the light off to the side. What I love about basic backgrounds like this is you can create a lot of different effects on one color just by simply adding light to the background or moving your subject away from the background and not having as much light hitting it, or by adding different colored gels and stuff that I'll show you guys how I do in a minute. But a lot of different effects and looks that you can do from one simple technique, just moving them away from the background. Yeah? The first one, the subject is close. The, they're both lit identically, but the one on the left, the subject is closer to the background. So light's bouncing off the white background and bouncing light everywhere. It looks brighter and more airy. Then I moved her away from the background by five steps, and then we got that effect. I could have also just feathered my light off, which I'll talk about that coming up, how to do that. But yeah. Yeah, another question in the background. Yeah, on the left, it seems like the shadow is darker. Is that the background? Yeah, because she was standing on a white floor. On the, when she's closer to the background, it, the, the floor came out and it was white. So when the light came out, yeah, so when the light came out, it, it, it changed all of the attributes of the entire image. So 
depending on what's around you too, like you could have a white wall over here and trying to get a dramatic shot. When the flash comes in and hits that wall, it creates all this fill light, right? So you have to watch out for that stuff too. This is tricky. A lot of photographers struggle with this. If you're a studio photographer and you're trying to figure out, if I have somebody wearing white and I want a white background, how do I get them to be separate, right? This is really, really hard to do for a lot of people. But I learned this from an amazing photographer in California named Jerry Avenom, who shoots like diesel campaigns and amazing stuff. He says this is very, actually quite simple. You need a lot of light on your background so it's even. Notice I got that big umbrella lighting the background. That's, it looks like it's closer, but it's pretty far away from her in the actual shot. Then you light your subject however you would like. And all you have to do is whatever light is hitting your subject. So say in this case, we're at ISO 100, hundredth of a second, and the light comes out of the front light, and it's at F11. When I turn on the background light, and light hits the background and evenly lights it, and then it bounces light back towards the camera, the light hitting her in the back of her back just needs to be one stop darker than the light on the front, and you get perfect separation. So F11 on the front, F8 on the back, which is exactly how I did this shot, and you get perfect separation. So you see pure white background, and notice she's wearing white, but it's not blending into the background. So white on white. Now, so depending on the screen that. you're looking at, it could look that way, but trust me, in, on a calibrated monitor, it does not look that way. The back was metered to F8, you said the power Yeah, so I would meter her front. Where's the word? I put my meter. So I'd meter the light hitting her on the front. If it says F11, I'd put the meter right here on her back, meter the light bouncing off the background and hitting her. If that's at F8, that means we have perfect separation between the two, and the background will always be pure white every time. So you adjust that by adjusting the light? Yeah, we just turn up the background light so it bounces off and hits her at more or less light until we get to that one-stop separation. Perfect every time. So now how do we add more lights to create crazy cool photographs with all this crazy stuff? Now that we've got the basics down, we've got the front light on, the right angle of light, the right power of light, how to do it, now we can do all kinds of cool stuff with multi-light techniques. So when you're shooting with more than one light in the studio, so say we have a main light and a fill light to fill in the shadows, because now we don't have ambient light to fill in the shadows for us. We have to use another flash to do that. Say we want a light way over here, and we have a light over here filling the shadows. The key with this is we have to meter the fill light first. Because if I turn on the main light, and it's at F11, and I want this one to be a little bit darker at F8, how do I know it's at F8? You can't. So you meter that fill light first to F8, then we add the main light until we get to F11. That's the, that's the best way to do it. So we meter that key light to one stop brighter if you're doing, say, three to one lighting. Or you could have the fill light be at F5, 6, and this could then meter this up to F11. And then you have a two stop ratio between the two if you want more drama. I know some of you are nodding your heads because you're very dramatic. That's cool. And then we meter our background lights after that to whatever you want. But I prefer them to be one to two stops darker than the main light. There's a reason for that because when light comes in from the background and hits someone and bounces into the camera, it's perceived to be much brighter than it is. So if your front lights was, say, F11, and your background light was hitting your subject right here at F11, this would look blown out. It would look really overexposed. So we want to turn it down to make it way more subtle. So here's an example of that. This looks crazy, right? You're like, oh my gosh, look at all this crazy stuff going on. It's just like here, I've got a seamless background. I've got a light on the front. I've got two lights in the back, just pointing at the back of my subjects at 45 degree angles. I put a black, uh, negative fill on the left because a lot of light was bouncing and I wanted drama in the shadows because these guys wanted an album-y looking shot. That's all that's going on here, very simple. And then we just added a light to the background, that one on the bottom right there. So the front light's at F11, the background lights are at uh, F5, 6. They have orange tungsten and gels on them. And then we just have that front light kicking in that cool dramatic light to the side. And here's what it looks like when I shot it in the studio, AKA my garage right at this time. This was shot many years ago. Um, and then I inserted the background from a Photoshop file, which is really easy to do. And we get this. So you get this cool drama. The reason I add those, that orange uh, tungsten gel to the background, because it matches what's that fiery look. So even though it looks like a flash shot, it looks like I created it, it has a little bit more of that ambient or that natural feel to it. Maybe, maybe he shot it on location. Maybe he didn't. You don't know. And I could have shot it on location. Now you can take that technique anywhere. So look at this crazy location with these weird, you can see right through those gold things in the background, but if I just overpower the ambient light enough, 
Add that front light, those two kicker lights, just like I said, this is the first test shot I took of this subject right there. It looks like we're sitting in a studio, but we're in an office space. You know, it looks, it looks rad. Reflectors and grids, so what do we do with these? Bad boys, so you can see you've got a typical flash, right, like this. And I'll show you this really quick. This is what the flash actually is, just this tiny little bulb, right? This is a reflector dish, a little five inch reflector dish. You put that on to control the light a little bit, but it comes out pretty much everywhere still. And the grids are great for just controlling that spill of light. So they come in degrees. This is a 20 degree grid. I use these a lot, which just means the light's gonna come out at a 20 degree angle. 40 would be a little more, 60 would be a little more. 20 is real tight pattern of light. This is great for background lights. Some photographers use these as front lights and they look amazing, but you gotta have people with like epic skin and be ready for a lot of retouching. Uh, which is not my thing. Uh, if you want to follow somebody that does that epically well, Lindsay Adler is a god at this. Like she uses these little snoops to paint a little piece of light right here, a blue fill light. That's it's ridiculous. She's amazing. Uh, but I'm sure the post production is not fun uh, on that stuff. But this is the effect that you can get. You can get this beautiful light on the front, and then notice that sliver of painted light down, uh, etching him out in the background. This is shot in my garage on the same background you saw earlier, sitting on my motorcycle. And I wanted something that just painted light in little spots and looked, you know, James Dean style, right? Same thing here for a, we a wedding photograph. Light on the front, but a little bit of kicker light on that background. A dreary, nasty kind of day. It was like raining and didn't look good. But if we added some cool light, we could just use the background as a backdrop instead. So that's what we did. And you can see here's the behind the scenes. And you don't have to use flashes that big, by the way. You can use you can use a, a speed light to do this, you know, with a modifier this big, a little teeny rapid box, and it will look pretty similar. I just love big lights because it makes me not have to try as hard. The bigger the light, the less good of a photographer you probably are. Just kidding. <clears throat> okay, so grid technique, where do we put the grids? If this is a background light, where are we gonna put this bad boy? Let me throw this back in here. Exactly, in terms of the subject. So hitting your subject, where should it be? Pretty much always. So if I, have a, if I have a kicker light, and I'll bring this out here so you guys can see, and I was photographing myself. One, the height, usually I like it to mimic whatever's going on in the sky. So if I have sun kind of back there, or high noon, I kind of want it coming in from a higher angle. I don't like them really low. In the studio, that can look cool if they're cascading across a bit. But I like them high and angled down at a 45 degree angle, and then hitting me at a 45 degree angle from my back. Does that make sense? Like this. If I put them over here, what happens is the light comes in and I, the light strikes the front of my nose and it just creates this nasty hot spot, always, even if the light's really tapered down. I don't like that. I prefer it like this, right? Keep it from hitting the face, right? Keep it back here. What do you do about the lens glare, the, the glare coming into the camera? Yeah, so as long as they're just moved out slightly and they got the grid on them, you won't get any flare coming into the lens. If you bare bulb these and don't have the grid in there, you have the potential for flare. So you can move them a little further away if that's a problem. Use a, a hood on your camera, that will help. Um, so height, angle, and then the power, just remember, subtle. Two stops, one and a half to two stops lower than your main light is a good place to start, and it looks great. Fill light, like we mentioned, um, having a fill light in the studio is, can be critical because then you can do these really dramatic light patterns. You can put light in this really crazy angle so it just looks dramatic, but then it doesn't look like there's no light on them at all. So you can bring a fill light in and fill in those shadows and still have this bit of drama going on, as you can see. So we've got like this, the light technically is way too high. But it looks cool on these guys who are, you know, we're doing an album shoot here. And then we've got that fill light filling in those shadows so it doesn't look overly dramatic. And you could, of course, can adjust those ratios based on your preferences. So feathering for softness and control, this is really cool. So you can do two things with feathering. One is you can light a whole bunch of people evenly with one light without having to move it further away. Because everybody remember this, my friend, uh, whose name I forget, says this all the time, light in close gets dark quick. Jim Schmelzer. Jim Schmelzer, right, he's dad, that's who says it. And what that means is that's the inverse square law. If I, if I move a light really close to you, it's gonna be bigger and softer, but it's gonna get dark really fast. It's like the bride holding her flowers, leaning into the window, and the window's right here. It's like blown out, perfectly exposed flowers and pitch black right here. You're like, what's going on? It's because the light is getting dark really fast. Every time you double the distance from a light source, it gets four times darker. 
So if I have four people lined up and I want to photograph them all from the side so I get some nice highlight and shadows, how would I light them all evenly without moving my light super far back and running out of power? Well, I just have to feather it, right? I just turn it. So what you do, if you're shooting a group of people like this, you point the center of the softbox two-thirds of the way through the group. So if I was photographing you guys up front I, and my light was over to this side, I would point it two-thirds of the way through you. You can take a quick meter reading and check. Does it all say the same reading or pretty close? You're ready to rock. And this is the effect. So this is actually done the light. Notice the light's very close. It's very soft. But everybody's evenly lit. So we did that because the flash was, and let me point on this side. The flash was over to this side, but it was pointing right here. So this girl, the flash wasn't even pointing at her. Like from her perspective, she just saw the edge of the light source because we needed less light to hit her because she's closer to the light source. Does that make sense? And it creates this amazing effect. So powerful. If you're in a studio photographer and you have a small space like we're in today, feathering your light between two or three subjects can be the difference between crappy studio photos and epic studio photos. Huge difference. You can also feather it for softness. So this is a shot that we did with Westcott where I said, I want to create a really soft, beautiful, subtle image. How do we do that? So here's a quick, short video showing you guys how that works. And I think this is a double click one. Yes. So there's some talking on this, but don't worry about it. They may be going out to the, to the World Wide Web on Facebook here. But essentially what you're seeing here is I'm taking the light um, that we're using, this giant Zeppelin in the studio, and we're going to angle it. We're doing glamour light, but we're going to angle it forward and then move it away from her like this. So just the edge of the light is hitting her, not the direct light, right? The indirect light. <clears throat> what that does, and you'll see it here in a second. So there it is. And then we did some with the fill. We did some without the fill. So it looks like a crazy angle. Like, how are you going to get a shot that actually works doing that? But what that does is if we were using it on the side, we would have feathered it like this away to just catch the edge of light. And I'll show you guys that coming up. If you're doing it glamour lit, we turn it this way to do the same effect, and it just catches the edge of light. It's tricky to do with glamour light because you have to have it on a boom, and you have to angle it forward. It's a little bit tricky. But it can create this amazing effect. Now, in these shots, it looks like the front of her face is overexposed. It's not on my screen. <laughs> so trust me. Uh, but it looks, it looks amazing. It's a great technique. Here's some other effect, effects doing that. The light's tabletopped, and this is for drama. It's not for pretty light in the eyes. It's just for cool, dramatic effect. And there you can kind of see the background of what I'm doing. A little cork board on the floor to fill in a little bit of light. Yeah. All right, we're going to bring Ashley in shortly here. So large lights. What can we do with large light sources? Here's the Westcott Parabolic. I use this quite a bit um, when I want something incredible looking, like insane looking, but i got to move the light away. So I need bigger light if I move it further away. So here's a shot we did out in Vegas in the desert. We wanted this really beautiful painted on light effect at high noon, like when the sun was just blaring, as you can see. And this is the effect that we were able to get from that, that one light. It's beautiful. That's sunlight hitting her on camera left. Um, and it's also short lit. Notice I'm short lighting her. And I feathered it. So I feathered it off to the side like this to just let the edge of the light catch her. The problem with feathering is you lose a lot of power. Because I'm not pointing it at my subject. I'm kind of pointing it that way. And so you need more power to do the same effect. And I think this is a, a video, but we're not gonna, I'm not, I don't need to show you this. This is a, actually, no, nah, I'm, not, I'm not gonna show you this particular one because we're just gonna, I, I don't wanna run out of time. But this is using another large light source um, when I'm shooting multiple subjects and I want the light to look painted on. So if I'm doing a studio shot, style shot outside or an album cover and I want just insane light, this is using the Zeppelin. This gigantic light, it's huge. Um, I want a big, big, big light source like that to be able to create the shot. And here's that effect of that huge light up close. It just looks amazing. It looks outstanding. Beep, boop, boop. Ah, there, oh, there it is in the background. So you can see the size of that light source, a little bit of fill light, and it looks, looks really, really cool. Same thing, just more demonstration images, some big lights and what they can do. They just have this really great effect of painting light on. OK, a couple more things. Indirect light. So if you want indirect light, Beauty Dish is the way to go where it's going to create that dead spot in the center. 
beauty dishes are great because they create this amazing specularity, like this kind of like, I just like to think of it as like starlight on your face kind of, it just creates all this like texture to someone, especially a silver beauty dish. So I'll use this on men. White on women, uh, silver on men, and it creates this effect, that sort of grisly chiseled look to their face. And because this, it's such a tight uh, spot of light if you put a grid on it, and I have a 20 degree grid over the front of it, it just pops light, and literally it was like just outside of the camera. It was barely, barely away from his face to create that hyper drama on his face. Remember, if you move it in close, it gets dark quick, and we get this amazing effect on their face. So if this is the kind of style you want, beauty dish might be your best friend. And they're also great if you shoot in windy places. So people that like shooting Hawaii, they're like, I can't use a softbox. It's like, you know, blowing in the wind all the time. Get a beauty dish. They perform much better that way. Is that one 45? That one was like straight to the side, just like this. I, I kind of broke the rules a bit and shot it right across his face for, for dramatic purposes. Clamshell lighting, this is cool. I'm going to show you guys this in a second here with Ashley. Uh, clamshell lighting is where we have a light coming in from the top, and we bounce some light in from the bottom, and it creates a very glamoury kind of look on the face. And it just looks be really pretty. Yeah, it fills in these shadows down there. It looks, and it makes that cool effect in the eyes. And this bad boy, when I'm going to show you this in a minute, this does it automatically in the perfect placement, and it's really rad. It creates that, that amazing effect in the eye. Light replacement, this is very cool. Uh, sometimes I'll take a speed light, like I found this cool prop, and I said, this would be great to have a light in here, but it didn't actually work. So I rolled it in. We had light in the background. Uh, this is just a rapid box and a speed light sitting up there, so simple little setup, putting some light on her face. And then I stuck a speed light in there with an orange gel on it and just fired it off, triggered it, and we get this effect. Boop. So it looks like this cool movie light's on her, but it's fake. You know, it's 100% fake. But it looks really cool. It looks glamorous and beautiful. So I just metered the light coming out of it on her to make sure it was a stop below the main light. Bam. That's it. And, and uh, the light itself was in your shot? Uh, yeah, the, yeah. well, I kind of hid it back there, so in case you could see some of it, but it was so bright when it came out, you wouldn't have seen it anyway. Uh, and it totally hit it, so I didn't have to do any trickery. Uh, but yeah. This is cool, too. This is something I learned from an amazing photographer in Nashville named Jeremy Cowart. This is called ground glass photography. This is where you take some other piece of optics, and instead of shooting your subject with your camera, you take your camera, or you take this other camera, like an old twin lens reflex, you point it at your subject, focus it, and then you take a macro lens and shoot into that instead. And it creates a really cool effect. Now, I have a video on this, but I'm not going to show you the whole video uh, because we're running a little short on time. But there you can sort of see. I'll just show this to you briefly. You see I've got the twin. This is a, a handmade one. It's a little lens element on the front, a focus screen inside, a cardboard box. That's all this is. So you push it in and out of the cardboard box to focus it. And then I put my macro lens. I shoot it in the back, light my subject on the front. And then whatever's coming through is what you end up seeing, which is this. Almost like using an optical bench in cinema. Exactly. It's really cool. So depending on what optics you're pointing into, it can have all kinds of crazy effects. Uh, I know people that like, you know, do a long shutter speed and run a light in front of the lens after the shot's been taken, or uh, Jeremy Coward shoots lasers onto the back of his and creates these wild effects, or has his subject shoot lasers back at it. It's, it's crazy. And it can also create you know, this kind of effect. This is the inside of the camera and the light coming into it, that little piece of cardboard. And you can see like the dirty little elements on the lens and how it looks like there's fingerprints on it. It's just really wild looking. So this is if you want to get really outside the box, do something really different. It's fun. Even, though, even if your clients don't love it, it keeps your creative juices flowing and it makes you feel good as a photographer doing something different. I like to show my lights in some shots. Sometimes I'll take a big light and just use it as my backdrop because it looks cool. Like, there's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do. Or put your lights in the shot. Like, it can look really, really dramatic. <clears throat> you can create haze and atmosphere. I recommend doing this as often as possible because it creates more texture. So smoke machines or smoke bombs or uh, uh, all kinds of different stuff. Uh, anything in the shot to create some atmosphere, I, I really, really love. Here's an example of just using a piece of frosted glass and having my subjects move towards it to create a a different looking shot. It's not a beautiful portrait, it's just different. And sometimes people love this stuff, it looks great as an album cover. Or in this case, we're standing outside and there was a lot of dust and dirt on the ground, so I had my assistant grab a handful with a shovel and just throw it in the air. So it looked like, it looks like something cool is happening when, it, when nothing cool is happening. You know? uh, so you can do all kinds of cool stuff with that. 
A couple other things, gels. Uh, I love using gels. I'm going to show you a quick uh, example here. This will be the last video that I show you guys, and then we'll get into some uh, demonstration with the last bit of time we have. So this is a video I shot just a few weeks ago here in New York. And we went out with uh, uh, a friend of mine, Jen. And we're doing all the same techniques I showed you. I underexposed the background in this two stops because I like the light coming down the stairs. And I wanted to add to that and create something cool. So it was really easy to do. I, in my head, I went, that light traping down the steps looks cool. That's dark in the background. So when I add the light, you can see it. Right? We have to have enough contrast. I feathered off the light on the front, turned up the background light until it looked cool. And then we shot those photographs. And here you can see, there's the effect. Beautiful. Two simple lights, one with an orange gel just for a little atmosphere feeling to it. What's that? Yeah, that's, that's exactly where it is. Yep, not, not far from here. Very cool effect. And there you can see the before and after when there's no light on it, what it was doing, and then when I added that little bit of subtleness to it and how much cooler it looks. Same thing here. Now this is just taking the light and pointing it at the background. So in, instead, I'm pointing it here and making that two stops underexposed instead of the back of my subject. So I put a light on the front, and then I just point it, as you can see, that orange circle of light in the background is the same light just pointing at the background. Same thing here. There's that texture and color. Instead of this being silver, is now that warm orange color because I just shot a light at it, and it's very cool. <laughs> love, love the look on her face in this behind-the-scenes shot. This is the same thing here, but it was like a tight, close quarters. So we just boomed up the light and shot it in the background. It's on a grid, so it wouldn't hit her in the top of the head. And then we were able to create that cool, dramatic shot by painting that light into the background. Very easy to do. This is one of my favorites. Westcott has this hanging up at their offices. I love this. This was shot in a bathroom hallway in Vegas. We were walking through the hallway, and I, they had this amazing wood-lined hallway. And I was like, if we put a strobe back here and put it close enough to where you see the cutoff of light like that, it's going to create a black backdrop for her, orange light shooting up on the sides, and we just put one flash on the front, small flash. This is just a medium-sized softbox. And boom, we shot it. And it looked really, really cool. ND filter, some people have asked me about this already in the front. I use what's called the Lee filter system. This is a piece of it. You just buy this little piece for the front of your lens. Um, and then there's a bracket that just clamps onto the front. And all this does, I won't use this today, but all this does is allows you to buy a filter, an ND filter, which is like putting sunglasses on your camera. So if I go on, it's really bright, and I have to shoot at f16, and I don't want my shots at f16, I want them at, say, f4. I can just put sunglasses on my camera and then just open up my f-stop. And the image will look exactly the same, just with a wider aperture. You can also do this with uh, high-speed sync. So you can, you can go that route if you have a flash that can do high-speed sync. Now, one of the ones that I have here today, this one does high-speed sync. The other one doesn't. I forgot why this image is here. Oh, this is, this is using an ND filter. So normally, this shot would have been at like f8 or f11. And I shot it at 2.8 with my ND filter on. Does that make sense, everybody? I've got videos on Westcott University where you can watch me use an ND filter. This also has an ND filter on it. You notice the image on the left and the image on the right. It's got that shallow depth of field. This also has an ND filter on it for that uh, sh blurred background effect. And so does this. All these have ND filters on them. I use it quite often because I like shooting at a wider aperture with flash. Double exposures is cool stuff you can do. This, most cameras do this in the camera. All you have to do is just make sure you have dramatic lighting where you have shadow, and then put your second subject in there. You can actually, I actually have a blog post on zackandjody.com showing you exactly how I created this. But Canon 5D3 has a double exposure mode. You take one. Put it on a light, uh, on a, make sure you put it on a stand. Uh, take the first shot, then line up your subject. You can see the shots in overlay mode, where you can see the first shot. You can put your second, these are actually twins. These are two brothers that are identical twins. And I sh shot the first one. Once I got that shot looking cool with all that dead space in the background of the, all those shadows, then I moved the second brother into the, the opening, and I photographed him. One guy was really close, one guy was really far away. And you can create a double exposure just like that. Very simple and easy. Same thing here, where I had him take one shot with his face to the right, one with his face to the left, but don't move his body. Make sure your camera is on a, a camera stand or a camera tripod, which I never use, so I don't even remember the name of it, on a tripod. 
And then you can create like just wild looking photographs that look like weird, you know, and I really love it. And then anti-lighting, I do this quite a bit, where I'm not actually intentionally doing portrait lighting on the face. I photographed my friend and he said, I don't want any portraits. I just want something cool for my website. He's a filmmaker and he didn't want pretty portraits. He just wanted anti-portraits. I said, okay. So we shot this kind of stuff for him. Same thing here. Here's an example of using hard light and soft light as a fill in the wrong position, down low. So it's weird, dramatic, but cool. It's just different. You know, you can do a lot of different stuff. This is literally using this right here as my main light. Uh, with a, there's a grid on it, I believe. Yeah, because it's not hitting the background. It's just hitting him, so it's, a, it's gridded. And then light mimicking, this is really cool. I shot this in New York a couple years ago um, where it was a cloudy day. We photographed her, it looked okay, but I said, man, imagine if the sun was coming through. So I had my assistant run back there with a boom and shoot an orange gel through the background, and I said, put it up high enough so it looks like the sun. You can actually see him in the shot. I never even took him out of the shot because most people don't notice it. But he's standing right there. I, I can take that out pretty easy, but um, yeah, it's a great way to mimic the sun. You saw that other shot where the sun was already set, but we put an orange gel in to make it look like the sun was still in the shot. Easy to do. Environmental lighting, I do this a ton. So I love this angle. We were shooting a real wedding here at the Boston Public Library. I think this is in Boston or this is in St. Louis, I forget. But I love this angle. This is the only place you could see this angle, but there was all this window light coming in from the side. I made it flat. I wanted light coming in from this side, back here, not over here. So we put a flash on this side, a rapid box, a speed light in the background to just light this up, and I overpowered the ambient light by two stops, and then we photographed that. So you get drama and contrast and all this cool looking stuff and the bride and groom loved it. Same thing here uh, where we can create that light mimicking effect, um, which I've already showed you guys this, this particular shot. And here where I can add, this is another behind the scenes of that same location. Notice you can see, see the little speed light right there? And there's the other one. They just have little orange gels that are pointed up at, until the exposure that was on my camera for the background brightness I wanted, I could just see it. So I just turned them up and down a couple times. And then in Photoshop, or in Lightroom, I just cloned them out really quick when I was done with the shot and created that final image. Or crop them out so you can't see the ground. And we get this really cool, really cool effect. And there's the behind the scenes. I, I think this was a lo long time ago. All right, I'm gonna bring Ashley up, if she doesn't mind. Hopefully she doesn't, because that's why she's here. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Say that again. Kill the ambient light. Typically, yeah. Typically, in the studio, ambient light is pretty dark, and if you're using studio flashes of any kind, usually they don't go low enough in power to even compete with the ambient light unless your shutter speed is open for a long time. Um, so in this case, the lowest setting I think this will get to at this distance is like f6.3, and that's going to overpower the the ambient light in here by. I'm guessing a couple of stops. So yes, typically I'll overpower the ambient so I have complete control. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do two setups for you guys. I'm gonna pull them straight into Lightroom so you guys can see them up on the screen in real time. And we're gonna see if all this stuff I've been talking about actually works. Uh, so I'm gonna switch here to mirror our displays. Open up Lightroom. And you can actually sit right there, my dear. I'm going to put this light back. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our little gray background. <clears throat> we're going to put one light on the front. I'm going to hook up my camera, tether it straight to Lightroom. So I believe I always make the mistake of turn your cam plug it in and then turn your camera on to make sure it works. And then we'll start our tether capture. So if you ever shoot in the studio, Tethering is great um, because what it allows you to do is see your images on a real screen instead of on your tiny camera screen, uh, which is not the best. Yes. You can actually see what's really going on. So if you have the time, it's great. What's also really cool is when you do this, and notice it already pulled up my Canon 5B3. This works really great. Notice here it says development settings. This is rad. So what you can do is you can go in and go, what's my favorite adjustment that I always use? Like say my color punch. And as they come in, it'll 
it'll kind of add that to it. Because I'm shooting raw, and raw means it zeroes the photo out. It takes contrast out. It takes color tones out. And it kind of puts it in the middle and expects you to add them back to your preference. So this is a great way to do that as I'm shooting live. Oops. I can move this little guy out of the way. OK. So now what we're going to do, how's it going? Good. Thanks for coming. You're the best. I'm going to move this giant beast out of the way so it's just not my shot. And I'm just going to check these background lights. Tighten this one back up. So what I've got in the background lights is just an orange tungsten gel inside each one of these. 20 degree grids, really simple. I'm going to angle them so they don't hit the background, but they just hit uh, Ashley at that 45 degree angle, one on each side. Now, this is not supposed to mimic a natural looking shot. This is a studio shot intentionally. So that one looks pretty good. This one looks pretty close. Just going to make a slight adjustment here, bring it down just a touch. And now for our front light. I'm going to bring this in, and I'll keep it on this side so it's easier for everybody to see me. And we'll try not to hit this giant monster that's here. And I'm going to turn this one on. I'm using, by the way, the Ellen Chrome uh, ELB uh, 1200 flash on the front and the Ellen Chrome ELB 500 on the back. There's just one power pack powering both of these lights. What's cool about this setup, I use all Ellen Chrome, is with this Skyport Pro controller, which is this. As soon as I turn this on, there's no triggers to, turn, you know, to figure out inside here, no receivers. They're all built in. It's scanning for whatever's active right now. And on the top of my camera, it actu actually says ELB 500, ELB 1200, and it tells me what power settings they're at. And all I have to do is just press this little select button. And if anybody can look down, you can see it just powers these up and down automatically. And I can do the same thing and power up my background one as well, which is cool. And then I can, of course, trigger them uh, from here as well, which is great. <clears throat> OK. Awesome. So now that we've got those on, we're going to walk through the process. We don't have to deal with ambient light, so we don't have to worry about the percentage on the meter. We just got to get the height, the angle, quality of light, all that stuff set in the right position. I can also trigger all my flashes from here and power them up and down uh, individually from this. This is the Psychonic L478DR for Ellen Chrome. So it's got an Ellen Chrome transmitter built into it, which is awesome. Because now you can see, I can just trigger all my lights from right here. And I can also press this little button right here. It's saying under because I didn't get much flash power. Yeah, 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 I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I'll usually have it in a pocket, or uh, my power packs have a little bag piece that they just slide in there. So if I have an assistant, they've just got it kind of hanging there, and I'll pull it out when I need it. Uh, but what's cool is you can also, uh, like I said, you can adjust it from right here if you want to, which is great. OK, so what we're, I'll just kind of do it all manually so you guys can see what I'm powering up and down and why. So what we'll do first here is we'll take our main light, and we'll short light Ashley. Bring this light up. Anybody remember how high? That's right. That's right. So you notice right about there, center of the light source is just above the center of the eyes. What else do I need to do? The bigger the light, the more uh, leeway you, ha you have with not having it perfect. The smaller the light, the more exacting it needs to be. If you have a video light and you're shooting a wedding and you're holding a video light up in a dark hallway, that light's got to be in the perfect position. Otherwise, it's going to look like a nightmare. OK. So you know what? I'm going to see if I can actually get this guy out of here. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to move it. Let's do this. I want to make sure everybody can see. Let's put it back here. OK. That's a little better. Great. OK. All right, so we got our main light set right here. Let me, uh... oh, that's awesome. Let me put the light on correctly. OK. 
I've had this happen so many times. This is my biggest complaint with Ellen Chrome that they hate when I talk about it is their mounting system. <laughs> there we go. Helps when you lock it into place. Okay. So now we got our main light set. We're going to shoot it nice and straight ahead like this. And we're just going to feather it off. And normally I don't use stands this big, but because we're in the studio and I don't want anything to fall on anyone, we're using kind of oversized stands. And do we have a sandbag that I can put on this? Yeah, normally I go light and flexible. And actually one of the best things to do is to get an assistant and to just use this as a monopod. They just carry it around like this and go pew, 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 pew. And a lot of times people go, how do I get an assistant? There's out, well, yes, pay them is a great idea. But if you can't afford an assistant, what is it that another photographer wants that you might have? Experience, Experience knowledge, information. You, there's always somebody that knows less than you. So I highly recommend, and there's always somebody who knows more than you. So always be assisting if you can, uh, whenever you can, because I still do that. I still go out and watch other photographers work. And then anytime you meet people that go, man, I would love to be able to shoot more weddings, and you're shooting a bunch of weddings, go, well, give me your name, and I'd love to have you come out, and you can watch, and you can help me out. And I, when we first started shooting, I created a list of like 20 people. We used to tweet it out, put it on Facebook, and I just create a list. And anytime I had a gig coming up, four or five days ahead of time, I just hit the list and go, hey, first person to respond gets, gets to come. And I would have somebody at every single wedding just walking around with my flash or carrying your camera bag. Yeah? I want to add, can add it to that. You want to, add, you want to be on my list? <laughs> Buy Westcott Prod, I'm going to come and I'll assist you for the whole day. Okay. So we've got our main light set up. We're going to back it up just a little bit so it's not insanely dramatic. Bring it down just a touch. Excellent. So notice we're feathering it off as well. So when we feather to the side, instead of pointing it right at our subject, we can sort of turn it this way. I don't have a ton of space here. Can we actually move? I can move whatever I want? You sure? OK. I'm kind of destroying the set here. But it needs to, it needs to happen. OK, there we go. If you're in a small studio space, use smaller gear. I recommend that. OK, so now we got this nice feathering. Notice the light's kind of shooting this way, and the edge of the light is hitting her more this way. So I'm going to have you, <clears throat> you want to stand or sit? What do you prefer? Stand. Let's have you stand. Because I got a feeling you look really cool standing. And I didn't have to move the light much. We'll move it up just a tad more. OK, so now, and we'll adjust this as we go to get it more and more feathered. Because this may come out, and you may see like, oh, a little bit of light was hitting here. Let's feather a little bit more. Because I either want to hit the background or not hit it, one of the two. OK, so now we just got to meter it, find out how bright it is. And you're actually standing in a perfect position right there. So all we got to do, meter our front light. It's at the lowest power setting it goes. And if I point it right towards me, it's coming out at f8. I don't know if you can see that or not. f8 at 100 to 100. Now, the shutter speed is irrelevant because we're inside, so it doesn't matter. Notice it also says 100% right there. Might be hard to see on the camera. But it says 100% because that means we're completely overpowering whatever light's in here. Um, so so that, that's, that's not that big of a deal. So now that we got that at 100, now we can meter our background lights. And where would I want these? This is at f8. That's the lowest this goes because it's really close and we're in a small space. If I wanted it less power, I could move it further away at this point or feather it off even more, which actually, I, let's just do that for the sake of argument and see. Now we're down to F7, so that's fine. And I can put my ND filters on at this point if I want to to lower the aperture, but let's not worry about it. So we'll shoot it at F7. Now my background lights, I want those one to two stops under the main light, so where would I put those ones? Anybody? Yeah, 3.5, F4, somewhere in that range. What's cool about these background lights is when I power them up and down, They'll go up and down simultaneously if you set it that way, which is really cool. So I'll meter just this one. And it's key kind of in the studio when lights bounce around. You don't want this light to affect that light to just kind of block it. And that light's actually not at, even going off. So we're just going to double check that it's on, which it is, but it's not firing for some reason. So let's find out why it's not firing. Let's see. 
dun, 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 dun. For some reason, this whole this whole thing is telling me it's locked and it's not working correctly. Hyper fail. When in doubt or under pressure, just take the batteries out. Start over. So I'm powering it back up here. It has to be set to all, so all the flashes trigger at the same time. Which it's not doing at the moment. And I don't know if, what I did exactly. Oh, it's on group one. You know how to unlock this thing? It's like went in a lock mode, and I have no, I've, it's never done that to me before. OK, so we're going to. Yeah, so we're going to switch over. I just got this meter from Ellen Chrome, so, or from Psychonics. So this is the first time I've used it as standing in front of all of you guys. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to power it up from here, or power it up and down from here. Oh, it's set to off. That's why. There we go. Oh, no, that's just the, uh, the modeling lamp. OK. Zach knows what he's doing. Don't worry, everybody. Holy cow. Okay. Okay, there we go. So we'll put this to uh, holy cow, we gotta unlock this thing, otherwise it literally doesn't work. Hang on. We might need a tech expert here. I literally cannot figure out how to unlock this thing. Anybody got a meter? You guys have a meter I can use? I don't know why this is locked. I want any light meter on the face of the earth. Somebody needs to tell me how to unlock this thing. Somebody Google it. What about the battery? I took the battery out and it reset and it's still locked. So here I am standing in front of everybody not knowing how to use my light. I use a manual meter for 10 years. It's that L478. How do you unlock it? There's no button to unlock this thing. I have the one, the model before that. The 358? That's the one I've used for 10 years. OK, yeah, 100, 100. Technology is so amazing. OK. So how do I, how do I, oh, there we go. OK, F36, yes. That's about where we wanted it. So now we'll just make sure both of these are coming out at F36. We'll make sure this is telling us the front one is the same. Oh, no, not even close. So this is telling us the front light's at F4. Big difference between the other meter, so maybe something's totally goofed up with that one. So we're going to turn this. So that's at F4, the front light. These are at F3.6. This is way too bright. We want to get that, these back around at least down to 2.8 or less. So we're going to power them down. So I went down one whole stop, which should be around 2.8, we'll see, 2.5, but I like subtle on the background lights, we'll go a little bit lower, 2.2, so that's pretty subtle, we'll just double check that front light, F4, perfect, what's that? All right, we'll see. So we should be in pretty good shape. So I'm at F4, ISO 100, 1 60th of a second. I sped up my shutter just a little bit just for camera shake purposes. So now what I'll have you do is I like you kind of turning this way slightly, but then body this way, but then face back towards the camera. Yeah, or face back towards the light. Oh, yeah. Put the trigger on. I don't think so. All right, here we go. So lean in towards me just a little bit, Ashley. Yeah, you look amazing, my dear. And bring your face over this way just a little more. Chin that way a little bit more, too. Perfect. Yeah, beautiful. And now i got to just make sure I'm setting my mode on here to all, because I just got my front light on the first shot. Aha, there we go. We'll do one more. Here we go. Bada bang. So here comes our first shot through where everything was set up. 
Bingo. I want to make sure that yeah, both lights are going off simultaneously. Beautiful. So it's a tad uh, underexposed for my taste, or just it's pretty neutral, which a meter tends to do that to you quite a bit. It tends to give you a pretty neutral effect. But bingo. Notice how bright that background light is, especially on the specular part of her. And it's at f2.2, and the front light's at f4. So we can actually bring it down even a little bit more. And now let's and notice how feathered off the light is, like it's pointing that way. Now let's see what the difference is if I point it straight at her. And you'll see the effect. Squeeze in here. It should give us a tad more power, so we'll just double check the brightness. Thanks for giving me this meter. Yeah, F5 now, so we'll just adjust our f-stop slightly. Same thing as before. Beautiful. And now check out the background difference. You'll see how much more light is cranking on the background. And there's no fill light on this. This is very dramatic, right? And notice the background. See how that light tapered down even more? Now it's like two full stops under the main light, and you still see it separating in there really beautifully. OK. So as you can see, the very first shot I took when everything was working correctly, all the lights were on, really cool. Looks great. Looks really, really beautiful. Now let's add something a little more dramatic to it. What we're going to do is we're going to bring in the eye lighter for a little fill light. And I'll actually probably move her a little bit further away from the background. So you'll kind of step up to here. What we're going to do, and maybe I can have some help just putting this light on here really quick. We're going to use this guy to move our light. Over. I hate these booms. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, that would work a lot better. Hang on. I'm going to go to the baby pin. Watch my face. Watch my face. You told me to watch my face. Yeah, so I want to boom it out so I can shoot yeah. straight at her without having to sit underneath. I mean, I can just go underneath the light, but it'll look a little bit better if I do it this way. Please. Oh, this is awesome. Can you raise that stand up for me just a hair? Oh, that's actually perfect. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Okay. How do I tighten this now so it's not spinning on me like that? Perfect. So when you do a clamshell shot, which is what we're going to do, we have to, have a little bit, we have to have the light angled forward a little bit so that the light will hit this and reflect back up into the shadows. It's very important. So we're just going to now raise this up a little bit higher than normal because we're going to be adding a lot of fill, so it's going to make up the difference. And the height of this, this is a, a little modifier called the eye lighter from Westcott. Eye lighter, yeah. It's got a silver interior. It's, I cut my finger. It's specifically designed to bounce light at the exact right angle back into her face. And it should be just, to, if she puts her hand straight down like this, it should be just at about that distance or about, I think it's like 35 inches. 30 inches from her. 
Man, I cut my finger. I feel like I'm falling apart here. All right, so now we'll meter this light, which is now just a tad bit brighter. It's at f6.3. The great thing about having background lights that are high quality is if I turn them up or down a stop or two, it's accurate. They're going to come out very accurate. Oh, thank you. I had one too. No, no, no. no. <laughs> this, this is the best one I've ever seen in my life. This is incredible. I cut my finger moving a light, and you guys give me band aids so I'm not bleeding in front of everyone. New York gets a bad rap, don't it? <laughs> it's gonna be. New York gets some awful rap. It's, it's gonna be worth it. You need somebody to help. This is perfect. There you go. Thank you guys. <laughs> so we we were at f5 on the last shot. Now we're at f6.3. So we're just that little bit of a difference. So I just adjusted my background light to the same amount. I just turned them a little bit brighter. That's all I did. Very simple. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there, Ashley. All right, so for this one, just lean into me a little bit. We're going to do a very straight on shot. <clears throat> Let me see how far I can actually back up here. Yeah, that's perfect. Super cool. So it's coming in. Dun, 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 dun. You see how it fills in all those shadows underneath? If you look at the middle screen, for those who are here in the studio, that one's a little more accurate, it feels like. And now, of course, because we're going directly into the computer, we can come over here and go, you know, what looks best on the shot? What kind of adjustment? And I think that one does. And if I zoom in, and you look at her eyes, see that effect that it has? It creates that beautiful catch light in the top and that beautiful light rimming around the bottom of her lights. It's very beautiful for up close portraits. Let's do another one right here. A little bit closer shot. Bring your chin down just a touch, perfect. Excellent. I feel like that kicker on the right isn't going off. Or it's just too subtle. Check out her eyes, that amazing effect that it has on the eyes. Yeah, it's firing, it's just missing her. That 20 degree grid can be really, really subtle. So I'm just gonna move it slightly to make sure we got it hitting her. I think it's just a little a little bit low. There we go. Do, 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 do. All right, let's try that one more time. Beautiful. There we go. Oh, and I'm not tethered. Hang on. Let's see if I need to get it to sync back up. There we go. Let's try that again. It's busy. It's trying to reconnect here. Let's see if it does. Hang on. Have to start our tether session again. Lightroom can be really finicky if you use it for tethering with this kind of stuff, if you accidentally unplug your camera or something like that. Turn the camera on. There we go. All right, here we go. Beautiful. Awesome. Let's do one more. 
chin up just a touch. It's great. It's very cool. See just how beautiful it is. You got that subtle kicker on both sides. Beautiful light on the front, that beautiful fill light underneath. So when you walk out on location, sort of the only thing that you need to do, as long as your meter doesn't lock, and I'm going to figure out how to unlock it today, obviously, <laughs> is just check that ratio, that 60, 80, 70%, 40%, whatever it is that you want. So before you guys leave, I don't want you to leave just yet, I'm going to switch back over because I've got some free stuff for you guys. See if it holds our flicker settings. Is it correct? Is it right? It's right. So if you guys have a business card or a, write your name on a piece of paper, pass them in. I'm going to give this away to somebody sitting right here. Hand them all to me. Throw them in a little bag if we are in my hat. I've got my hat. Yes. Free stuff. Yes. <laughs> throw them in, throw them in. Pass the hat back. I feel like I'm begging for change or something. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Everybody in the studio probably can't see anything. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, nice. <laughs> Put my own card in there. Oh, yeah, pa pass it up, pass it up. Awesome. Oh. Here's another one. Another one. We'll know it's you. Throw it in there. Yeah. Can I just put your yeah. name on your card? I don't see the red specular highlights that are in her hair presently. Yeah. So it was the gel bouncing off the front of the white, and that's what allowed it to. Oh, to create that specularity? Yes. Yes. Cool. Say that again. You want to? Not yet, not yet. This is going to be the best part. OK, so really quick, one I'm going to give away. We have a five-hour live wedding course. I'm going to give that to somebody. So the winner of this, just come up to me afterwards, and I'm going to show you how to get it, because it's an online e-course. I don't have a physical copy. <clears throat> oh, so the winner is, you want to pick? Close your eyes, close your eyes. Whichever one you grab first. Oh, she got a piece of paper. Jamie Riva? Riva? Yes. OK, so ho hold on to this. Come up to me afterwards. So this course is really cool. It's Jody and I photographing an entire wedding live. Um, and we walk you through every step of the process, how to connect with your clients, how to find great light in any lighting situation, how to use off-camera flash practically, how to shoot the entire reception, how to capture outstanding photos throughout the wedding day, how to get everybody to cooperate with you, how to organize a wedding day. It comes with like free PDF downloads on how we start organizing the wedding four months in advance and all this crazy cool stuff. So it's a really, really cool course. Um, I'm also going to give away my in-camera light course to one winner right now. I actually have a physical copy, and you can get an a e-course copy if you want. So the winner of this one is Ben Han. Yes. So Ben wins that one. Nice. So here's the actual, we don't have a lot of these left, the actual DVD copies. But if you want the e-course version, which is cooler, it's the same thing, but just in an e-course format. Just come up to me, I'll give you a link. Um, I'm going to give away my reception lighting course, which is right here. This is brand, brand new. Uh, one winner is. Come on. The tiny one. Craig. Lowy? Craig Lowy. Same yes. Thank you. Uh, so then if anybody wants to get any of those, come find me. You can get one for 97 bucks, and it'll come with a bonus business course and a bonus natural light photography course. Then the last thing, this is a free thing for everybody watching here. Everybody online can get this for free. I'll have a card, and some of you gave me that card, but you can get it back if you want. But shoot flow 
is a way to run and manage your entire business without burning out. It gives you our entire workflow system for building a six-figure photography business. Um, and it's incredible. And my phone is chirping in my ear. So it's really cool. It's an online piece of software that you can use. You can try it for 100% free. Everybody that's here gets a 30-day free trial of it. Here's an example. Like You can send a questionnaire to your clients. It does contracts, payments, tasks, emails, everything is all built in. And you can send this wedding questionnaire to your clients and a click of a button build your entire wedding day timeline in five seconds. It should take us four hours to do this kind of stuff. It's crazy cool. So anybody can get this. Uh, it takes 30 minutes to set the whole thing up. It includes our entire um, contracts, wedding, uh, uh, wedding workflow, all of our emails, everything that you need. You can also run your entire portrait business with it as well. It's, it's crazy cool. So just go to that link, bit.ly slash shootflow 30 days free, and you guys can get access to that entire thing. Any questions before we close out from anybody that might be relevant to us or the online audience about anything? You Bring them. Yes, if you want my slides, shoot an email to studio at zachandjody.com, Z-A-C-H-A-N-D-J-O-D-Y. I didn't put a link up. I ran out of time. Studio, studio at zachandjody.com. And I can send you a link uh, to all my slides from today's keynote. And you can have them all for free. Is, Any other questions? Is that ampersand or Zach Z-A-C-H-A-N-D-J-O-D-Y dot com. Yep, good question. Thank you. Anybody else? We're right at time. Oh, reminder about the contest. Yes. Buy any Westcott product from anywhere or just from Westcott? From, from Adorama. Any, Westcott any Westcott product, product from Adorama. Either online or here at the store. Online or here at the store between now and May 23rd. And you can win. Yeah, you'll be entered to win, into a drawing to win two round trip, trip tickets to Nashville from anywhere in the country, $1,500 in Westcott products an eight-hour master class with just me, teaching me anything you want to know. We can go out on location, shoot. I promise you my light meter will be working by then. Uh, <laughs> you have it yeah, I'll figure out how to unlock it. Hang out in Nashville? And yeah, you guys have two, two nights in a hotel and meals for two days. And the airport, the Nashville airport, has entertainment in it. They it does. Music all over Country the music in Nashville. Music city. It's amazing. <laughs> so you'll come hang out with me, my wife. You might, you might get to meet my kids, uh, unless you're a creeper. Um, and yeah, just buy any product from Adorama. I'd love to have you guys. But with that being said, I'll stick around for questions to anybody else. But thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Great job.